you. This content is on locus of control, and you can think of locus as being location. So what aspects, where do you think control comes from of your situation, your world, your life, your decisions? So locus of control is the extent to which people believe they have control over the situations and experiences that affect their lives. This is the work of Dr. Julian Rotter. Um, so where do you stand on this? Do you control your world as sort of like this woman who, you know, feels empowered, we can do it, even though the situation is hard? This stems from uh, World War II, I believe, when women had to step up into the workforce and um, do things they hadn't done before. We can do it, a show of courage. She controls her world, she believes. Um, or does your world control you? Um, so are you sort of vulnerable to the impositions of the world? Are you feeling more like a victim than that you have control? So this is the idea of locus of control. Um, the idea that each of us differ in the extent to which we believe we control outcomes for ourselves. And it's touted as a personality trait, though it gets a little nuance as we begin to understand the impact of the social environment. So um, dimensions of locus of control um, tend to fall along a continuum, meaning that you can have more or less of this, that you're not likely to be fully on one extreme or the other, and situations may vary. So you may have an internal LOC or locus of control. And in this aspect, you would be attending to have the belief that your behavior is guided by your personal decisions and efforts, that your situation is guided by your personal decisions and efforts. So you have control, like that woman in the first image. Some individuals, according to Rotter's theory, have more of an external locus of control believing that his or her behavior is guided by fate, by luck, or other circumstances outside of themselves or external circumstances. So Rotter's originally framework, original framework gave us those two dimensions, internal and external locus of control. And now we've divided this external factor into luck and powerful others. So let's take a look at that. Um, well, let's begin first by saying, what can we control? So treatment models, um, you've maybe heard um, the um, prayer that they use in Alcoholics Anonymous teaches the serenity prayer, it's called, teaches people to accept the things that cannot be changed, the courage to change the things they can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So what things can be changed and what things cannot be changed. And where do you draw your line? So for example, um, here's all this garbage and it's overflowing onto the ground. If this is a situation that bothers you, do you feel that you could change the situation or at least take steps to change it? Or do you feel that it's out of your control? It's part of the external situation. Um, what about this? Boy, it's cold out today, frustrating. Nothing, you know, it's miserable. Is this something you can control and change or something you can't change? And so this is the question that all of us have to ask and we differ on the extent to which we believe things can be changed. Um, so the knowing the difference becomes an individual personality trait as well as whether we can accept things and take action to change things we can. So think about what is your greater struggle? Is your greater struggle passivity that when you could act, things could be better, but you're tending to be passive or to not act? Or is your greater struggle in non-acceptance, resisting or feeling angry or trapped in by things that you cannot change? Or is your greatest difficulty the wisdom piece of that you have a hard time seeing what can and what can't be changed, a hard time distinguishing between those two. Um, so as far as me personally, I would say that I tend to have a pretty strong internal locus of control, tending to believe that more things can be changed if I put forth effort than actually can be changed. So I tend to take probably more action in certain ways than 
are desirable or tend to mistake things that can't be changed for things that I could possibly change. Um, so I don't know where you would fall on this trait. Do you tend to be passive, not take action when you could? Or do you tend to like uh, clench on and get frustrated with things that can't be changed? Like your, your, you know, your partner in life has a drinking problem and you feel frustrated trying to change this all the time and you can't. So anyhow, it's worth thinking about, I think. What can we control? What do you complain about might be an indication of something that you could apply this filter to. So you complain about the weather, you know, can that be changed? Are you making a mistake if you get frustrated with that? Um, can you complain, do you complain about this garbage? Is that something that you could change? So the things that you complain about are the things that you have to kind of weigh on this. Could it be changed? What action could I take to change it? And where on the continuum am I falling in terms of determining whether it can be changed? So that was internal locus of control on the previous slide. Now, external locus of control used to be just one dimensional in Rotter's original framework, but we now understand a little bit more about this tendency to think that things happen because of reasons outside the self. And one of those is just luck, like if, if you know, things are going your way, you attribute it outwards, you got lucky. It's nothing inside you. You're saying, oh, I just got lucky here. Um, on the other hand, um, powerful others is another reason why people might tend to develop an external locus of control. And if you live in this world and you are in a disempowered position, then it might be reasonable for you to have more of an external locus of control because there may be things that genuinely are out of your control because of the situation that you're born into. Um, and so let's consider this more as you think about your own locus of control. Um, and if you do identify ways or times or situations where you tend to exhibit or experience an external locus of control, then think about whether this is a behavior or an attitude that is learned through behaviors um, being part of a disempowered group. And of course, disempowered groups could be my, uh, you know, minority groups in the United States or in any country, whatever group is the minority. Um, or it could be gender groups, like uh, women tending to have less power than men, especially historically. Or it could be age groups. Um, if you're a teenager, for example, or a very young person, you may not be taken as seriously or have as much credibility. And so you may feel a bit more that you're a victim or your behaviors and the world around you is subject to what the powerful others around you dictate. Um, or it may be that you're very old even and you're in a nursing home and you have no longer your physical strength or your mental acuity and now you feel that you have a very little control. So we'll think about this um, as we look at the characteristic link to internal and external locus of control. So a couple of things to know is it is learned, it's not inborn, you're not born, born with a locus of control and it's not permanent. It's a response to circumstances and environment in your life. Um, and second, it's changeable. Um, outdoor education, for example, things like Outward Bound, or on this uh, place where teenagers go, if they get into trouble in North Dakota, um, they're working with animals and they're learning to develop more of an internal locus of control rather than a powerless sense of themselves. So is an internal locus of control desirable? Well, in, generally, in general, it seems to be psychologically healthy to perceive that one has control over things that one is capable of influencing. But it's not quite as simple as that as with most things in psychology. It's not internal always good, external always bad. For example, um, there are some benefits. Health, um, in general, people are healthier. Um, 
have like having a ch having achievement oriented, having good jobs. If that's a balance, and uh, meaning that they're not too goal oriented, and if they address competence and opportunity. So, for example, if you take an inter your your locus of control is internal, that is your controlling the things that you feel you control can control um, and you're applying for a job and you're very young and this is going to be your first job opportunity so if you have an internal locus of control you go into it believing you have control you can put forth your effort and do your best and control the to some extent control how that situation goes but it and it can be very good but you should include in your framework how competent you are. Do you have the skills and experience that are needed? And is this opportunity arising for you? Like, are there generally opportunities like this for you? But it could also be unhealthy, leading to like tendency to worry, neuroticism, anxiety, and depression if you internalize too much. What happens if you internalize too much and then you don't get the job is you may get into a cycle of self-condemnation, criticizing yourself or feeling unworthy. Especially if those things are due to like you have a lack of experience, uh, you haven't developed competence yet, or a lack of opportunity. There's just the, the chances to learn the things you need to know just aren't present for you. So you can see it can work both ways. It might be a little better in the case that the opportunity isn't available, for example, that you blame that lack of opportunity. That would be accurate. And so our trends, um, internal looks of control is tending to be more male than female. So uh, tending to be more older than younger and tending to be more higher level employees than lower level employees. And if we think back to the power slide that we just looked at, we can think of all of these second groups, female, younger, and lower level, are groups that have less power. And so here we can say, well, it's not an inborn trait, but it's an interaction between situation and characteristic. And external locus of control can be healthy because it could lead if you are saying, well, say la vie, I just get lucky or I don't get lucky, well, you could feel pretty happy, easygoing, relaxed. But on the other hand, it could create limitations for you. It may lead to lack of initiative or um, you may be inclined to not explore your um, potentials because you're kind of happy-go-lucky, external locus of control. And here the trends are just reversed. And so um, we can just think of those patterns as interesting um, distinctions between those with internal and external locus of control. So how is a locus of control developed? Well, in part, it's developed through reinforcements and modeling in the environment around you. So consider this scenario. A child at grandmother's house breaks a delicate sculpture while roughhousing in the living room. And both and will have two different scenarios occurring. Both of them go tell mom about this. And mom says for child A, it's not your fault. Grandma shouldn't leave that sort of thing around the house. Of course it's going to break when the kids come over. Scenario B, same scenario. The second child goes to mom and, and mom replies, you always need to look carefully around you before you play rough games. Those games are best played outside because people like to keep delicate things inside their houses. Do you think we should try to buy grandma a new sculpture? And so in both these cases, we have two different responses. Um, one of them that if it happened, both of them, if happened often, might lead to a different trait or a different cognitive characteristics. These reinforcements create beliefs about what causes actions. If they happen repeatedly, then these belief systems will become integrated into the child's personality and form a trait, such as what we're talking about now, internal or external locus of control. And that's the end of this content.